Hey, what's going on, Landon? Yeah, I thought I had to uh, have a spacey background for today. So thank goodness for Zoom's uh, Earth View. Yeah, this is amazing, man. But I mean, obviously, we just met in person um, last week in Miami for the All In Summit, but I've known about you for a few months now. So I'm excited for others to learn as well. And we're excited for the presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me. All righty. Yeah, thanks, Landon, so much. And uh, appreciate to the, uh, the inside team. Um, as he mentioned, we had a chance to spend a little bit of time together at the All In Summit last week. And uh, it was a really remarkable experience and events. I'm always energized anytime I get to talk to founders and investors um, that are solving some of the world's largest problems. Um, and that's exactly what we're focused on here at Space VC. So as Landon mentioned, my background is actually on the founder side. So, uh, you know, we'll, I'll get a little bit into that experience in a second, but, you know, I was a founder of a software company in the enterprise space for over 10 years. And just 18 months ago, at the beginning of last year, launched this VC fund as a solo GP. And when I launched the fund, I remember writing a blog post and sharing it with my network, uh, talking about why I started a space venture capital firm. And the reason I did that is because as I was talking to my network and a broader audience, I realized that space was actually deeply misunderstood. And to no fault of anyone, um, we're all incredibly busy and we kind of you know, correlate and adjust to what we see in the headlines and in the media. So for the average person, you might think that the opportunity in space is really hedged around space tourism or rocket launch or going to Mars or asteroid mining or something like that that you see in the headlines nine out of 10 times. But as I dig in and did research on a passion that had been you know, something that I hadn't been able to spend a lot of time until I exited my company, um, I was flabbergasted at the opportunity in space and wanted to build a venture capital firm that took advantage of that. So Space VC is an early tech, uh, early stage deep tech firm. We invest in software, infrastructure, information technology, and climate technologies that are at the intersection of space. And one of the reasons we did that was also a timing component. So when I talk to founders, you know, I'm always asking them, you know, what does your product do? What problem are you solving? But why does a company like yours need to exist now? Similarly for venture, why, do, why does your venture capital firm need to exist now? What opportunity are you taking advantage of? And for us, one of the things we're really excited about is there will be more advancement in our commercial space industry in the next five to 10 years than all of human history combined. And for those of you that aren't at the ground level of space and, and might be a little confused about why that is, I'll, I'll spend two minutes talking about it and then I'll get into a little bit of the fund and, and what we do. So like most startups, you know, part of the reason software and SaaS startups are so attractive now is because it's cheaper and easier to start those companies than ever before. With AWS and Azure, you've got Carta, you've got different website builders. It takes only a couple hundred or thousand dollars to start those companies compared to a few decades ago. Well, similarly in space, our core infrastructure is getting cheaper, more accessible and more reliable than has at any point in human history. So on the left-hand side here, you can see that launch costs are dramatically decreasing. If you were to want to put something that was about a kilogram in weight into low Earth orbit in the 1960s or 70s, that would have cost you forty dollars or $50,000 per kilogram. Today, that figure is about one or $2,000. And with Starship, it's going to go down to a few hundred dollars. Similarly, the number of active satellites in orbit is exponentially increasing. The reason this is exciting is because satellites you can think of as one of two things. They're either collecting information, whether that's about climate, whether that's about agriculture, whether that's about utility grids, et cetera, or they're connecting populations, whether that's rural schools in Brazil, like Elon was just tweeting about with Starlink, or whether that's you know a parcel ship that's crossing the Atlantic to provide more real-time updates. You're seeing space power a lot of the day-to-day -day applications and technologies that might not be obvious for most of us. And so... That is the crux of our thesis at Space VC. We're not investing in science projects. We're not investing in things that aren't venture investable, like you know, uh, mining on uh, the, the, the Martian surface or, or asteroid mining or, or things that are decades away. We're investing in technologies that leverage space to make life better here on Earth. And as a part of that, I think almost every one of our portfolio companies has a B2B or an enterprise angle. So we're investing in companies that help us better analyze, measure, and act on climate data. We're helping uh, invest in the next generation of GPS and weather infrastructure, things we all use on a regular basis, but many of us might not realize that that's actually space technology. I talked a little bit about connectivity, but thinking about the next generation of Bluetooth and IoT connectivity as well. 
In addition, my background with software, we spend a lot of time on SaaS companies. Space right now is at an exciting point where we're essentially creating the app store for space. So all of these satellites are collecting all these unique data sets. Now we have an opportunity to build the downstream software tech stack, just similarly to how large enterprise companies have for HR or marketing tech or, or data infrastructure. And yes, lastly, part of space is security. So we've made one investment in a company that is building the Android for space um, and helping us uh, better understand uh, assets in and around space from potentially adversary countries. And so that's our thesis. That's what, that, that's what we're investing in. A little bit about my background. So again, I'm a new VC. So I take a little bit of a different approach to investing and working with our founders. And a lot of that has been informed based on my experience as a founder myself. So a few college classmates and I dropped out in 2011 in uh, Boston. We were building an enterprise software company that helped large brands like the NFL, L'Oreal, Procter & Gamble collect different types of data and then synthesize those data sets through complex data warehouses and their enterprise tech stack. And over a decade, we were privileged enough to raise over 90 million and I did exit the company last year, but that journey was far from easy. And like most startup founders, uh, there were highs and there were lows as a part of that journey. And so when I work with founders, I find that we have a deep empathy for what it actually takes at the ground level on the day-to-day, -day, the decisions that founders are faced with. And that's really where we like to spend a lot of time. Although I haven't spent my entire career in space, I've got up to speed very quickly. And my background in scaling SaaS and uh, IT companies has been very helpful. But I've added to our team some of the brightest minds in space, um, folks that were executives at SpaceX, Blue Origin, NASA, and other commercial space companies to really help give our team a well-rounded, um, uh, you know, uh, whoop, my standing desk dropped, <laughs> a well-rounded team to help uh, startup founders, regardless of if they need help on go-to-market, technical issues, or, or recruiting co-founders. So a little bit about our fund strategy. We're primarily early stage focused. We're writing checks anywhere as small as 50K to a quarter million, typically pre-seed and seed, but we've done a handful of series A as well. So we'll have about 25 to 30 portfolio companies by the time it's all said and done. And this is where we spend the majority of our time. We have done a couple of late stage investment opportunities though. Many of our LPs, which are all individuals, these are CEOs and other successful entrepreneurs that wanna get exposure to space. Uh, there are some exciting late stage space companies as well. And so we have done larger deals anywhere from 250K to um, our largest was actually 15 million um, that we've done so far. These are some of the co-investors we've worked with. Um, I share this mainly to say that, you know, space is becoming an interesting and an attractive a surface area for even some of the generalist funds to invest in. You know, many, many of the brand names and blue chip names in Silicon Valley are starting to have one or two space companies. And so what we like to talk about is how we want to work with the world's most promising space companies that are selling into B2B and enterprise tech. Um, and we're lucky to co-invest and work with a lot of these investors. What's most important for founders when you're syndicating around and pulling investors together, especially early on, is to get a lot of diversity. So we're obviously very deep and verticalized in our expertise at anything around aerospace or space, whether it's talent acquisition, supplier uh, relationships, uh, customer introductions. Uh, but obviously all of these uh, partners as well can be really helpful as you scale your company too. So I'd advocate for founders to always get a nice balanced cap table. So we've got 12 companies so far in our portfolio. I won't speak to all of them, but maybe I'll shout out a few of them that might be of interest to this audience. So SpaceX is um, you know, one of the most important companies, private companies in the world right now, not just in space. SpaceX completely revolutionized the commercial space industry with reusable launch vehicles. Um, they'll continue to do so with Starship. And a bit of a bold prediction, but what I think SpaceX will actually be most known for in the next five years will be their Starlink product, um, which is providing internet connectivity um, to war-torn populations in Ukraine, rural uh, school-based communities in Brazil, or, or farmers here in the US that don't have high-speed broadband. Um, so a really important um, launch and connectivity company. Uh, Loft Orbital there is also one of my favorite uh, stories. Um, we are seeing a lot of enterprise companies wanna come into space, but you know, be intimidated by the complexity of building or buying or launching satellites. So Loft Orbital is essentially the Uber rideshare for space. If you don't want to buy or, or have an entire mission for a dedicated satellite, you can outsource it and share it with other customers using Loft Orbital service. Zona is a really interesting one. They're building the world's first privatized GPS constellation. 
So many of you might not, not know that the GPS that we use every day on you know, Google Maps or Apple Maps or you know, Waze, that backend infrastructure is actually a, a 20 satellite constellation that is run by the government. And, and GPS just relates to uh, the US or the Western version of that. There are other uh, nation state constellations as well providing their uh, you know, global positioning uh, and navigation service. Um, and so we believe, especially with autonomous vehicles, there's really interesting opportunities around privatized GPS. Uh, a couple more in our portfolio that I'll call out, True Anomaly, uh, founded by Air Force and Space Force veterans. Um, this is a stealth and classified company, but they're essentially working with the DOD and, and some of our um, service branches to help us better understand and have the high ground in space, um, essentially building the Andrel for space, um, uh, Andrel being Palmer Lucky's company. Um, and, and lastly, uh, CSC there in the bottom, a radiation shielding composites, um, something cool that many of you might not have known, when you go into space, you don't have the benefit of the Earth's atmosphere to protect you from solar radiation nearly as much as we do on Earth. And on Earth, we wear sunscreen, obviously, to protect from some of those harmful UV rays. Well, in space, a lot of companies leverage just really thick pieces of aluminum. And uh, CSC has actually created a new composite, uh, a, a new polymer composite to replace aluminum that's lighter and more effective uh, and, and more sustainable for the environment. So those are some examples of some of the companies that we've invested in. Uh, Loft Orbital, again, we've only been investing for about a year and a half, has been one of the early breakout companies. And I'll share this because it, it's important to know that whether you're building a company in space or elsewhere, um, the headlines about how much capital you raise is nice, but it's really about customer traction and the business you're building and the fundamentals. And so uh, Loft Orbital was lucky enough to raise a large round from BlackRock last year. But what I was more excited to see was earlier this year, they uh, announced a new customer, uh, Earth Daily, um, which is a $150 million contract for them. So for a Series B company, that's really exciting and, and kind of shows the opportunity around that um, uh, hosted payload Uber rideshare uh, business that they're building. So this is my last slide. Um, a lot of what I try to do as a VC and what we try to do as a firm has been built by the experience that I've personally had pitching to other VCs and raising almost 100 million in venture over the past decade. And I can say I've had some great experiences and I've had some terrible experiences in working with venture. There, there's no one size fits all. And so what we try to do uh, with our fund is just be really self-aware of where we can add the most value and what the founders that we're working with need on a daily basis. So sometimes that's simply just founder empathy. They're going into a boardroom. We typically don't take board seats and they just wanna talk about the strategy going into that meeting or some tough questions they might be asked. We're the call that founders make when they wanna ask a, a question uh, and they don't wanna be embarrassed by it because it's their first company that they're building. We obviously have a ton of connections in and around space. So even if you're building a software company that takes climate data and you're not putting anything in space, we work with a lot of companies like that to help them recruit that ne next executive, help close that next deal, um, or maybe even uh, you know, work with different suppliers or vendors if they need. And lastly, one trend that I'm seeing that's really interesting, especially for first-time founders, is VCs stepping in and helping their founders raise their next fundraising round. Obviously, this is what we do all day is talking to other VCs and understanding the capital markets. And so um, it's something that we at Space VC are spending more time doing is helping our founders raise their next round, bringing in the right partners that we think will, will help them in the next phase um, and, and add strengths to maybe where the company is weak currently. So that's a little bit about us, why we're bullish on space and uh, climate and infrastructure and software around it. And here are my contact details if you want to reach out, uh, DMs and, and inboxes open. Jonathan, that presentation was astronomical, no pun intended. Thank you so much, man. <laughs> I really enjoyed that one. Love the pun. <laughs> that, was, that was a shitty joke. I'm sorry. But um, okay, so let's get to some of my questions. Um, so obviously, I think there are probably a lot of assumptions that are made about space and the specific work that you're doing. People probably think that you're only investing in rockets, uh, but no, you really spoke about the intersection of space. So there are a lot of other sectors that fall um, within that. So you invest in software companies, as you just mentioned, climate, commercial, military. What are some other like common misconceptions that uh, maybe LPs or even fellow founders have um, gotten uh, wrong about space VC? Yeah, I, I think maybe I'll highlight two things. One is that space by definition is always very capital intensive. And certainly if you're building a rocket or if you're trying to build a 300 satellite constellation, it's gonna be more capital intensive than a software company that is serving the, the, the content creator community. But as, as you've just mentioned, Landon, um, the, the definition of a space company is, is, is graying, it's, it's you know, expanding. And so 
the first misconception is, you know, we're investing in a lot of software companies that just leverage something called geospatial data, mm -hmm. data from space, um, and they're solving applications here on Earth. So I'll give two fun examples. Um, one is in the insurance industry. There's a lot of insurance companies that when there's a wildfire or damage to your home, they want more real-time insights to the state of your home, what got damaged, imagery, et cetera, so that they can immediately file a claim. So you don't have to go through a multi-month process. Well, you can use drone and aerial and different satellite uh, image data sets to actually do that in real time. So we're working with software companies that provide something like that. So that's just one misconception about when we talk about space, there's actually just pure software companies that are leveraging geospatial data as well um, to disrupt certain business models. I think the other thing that we don't think of much, as much about is the role of government in, in industries like space. And what we have seen is government from being the sole customer or trying to build it themselves to enabling commercial companies to be successful. And we're a big fan of that public-private partnership because we think companies like SpaceX and others are, are maybe a little bit more apt to be able to build rockets at a fraction of the price compared to when you know government tries to build that itself. And so uh, we're a really big fan of the public-private partnership we're seeing across the board. So those are a few things that um, maybe uh, aren't obvious unless you're in the space industry every day. Totally. And as for the company that you guys are um, receiving deal flow on, we have a wonderful question from Megan in the audience. Um, what stage are you guys focused on? Is it seed, series A, um, and also check size that you guys are writing? Yeah, so I'll share a little bit of insight. You know, when we start a VC fund, we kind of have a focus that we're going to invest everything from pre-seed to series A. But then based on what deals we've actually done, we have to kind of calibrate because we have a certain portfolio construction that we're trying to achieve. So right now, to answer your question, Megan, I would say we're really focused on pre-seed and seed. So anywhere from a couple of founders, pre-product, pre-revenue, you know, just an idea and presentation. We love being the first check-in all the way up to maybe you've done a, you know, an initial mission or you have an MVP and you're signing your first couple of customers. Um, that's a good phase for us to jump in and be part of the journey. Totally. And uh, I know we spoke yesterday and you gave me some great advice during the conversation and speaking about cap table, um, you know, balancing your cap table. Um, and specifically, you were saying that you want a good mix of like large funds and smaller funds. The larger funds are going to offer, you know, the greater network um, of other companies that you can be able to, you know, collaborate with um, and also create deals with. And then the smaller um, funds, you know, will give you that expertise more or less. I'd love for you to kind of explain that and break it down a little more uh, for our audience of founders. Yeah, this is really informed from my experience as a founder. I have found that having more different, diverse networks and ecosystems and types of investors on your cap table um, help enable you for success because you never know at what moment you'll have a different challenge in, in either an angel or a solo uh, you know, GP firm or a large generalist firm will be able to jump in and help you out. And so you know, certainly while there are VC funds that, you know, will want to hit their certain ownership percentage and take a majority of the round or the full round, I really strongly encourage founders to think about building the most diverse set of investors. And I mean diverse both in skill set, obviously who the individuals are you're working with, um, their background and experiences, the networks they can provide. So as an example, you know, when we're investing in companies, a lot of the times they may have one or two deep tech investors on their cap table like us. Then they may have a larger generalist fund that could obviously follow on for a large Series A or Series B, which our fund, you know, that's not how we're built today to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have strategic yeah. angels and advisors on their cap table too that could be great for talent acquisition or customer introduction. So I always view VCs that you bring on as adding to the collective strengths and weaknesses that you have internally as a team. So always just being really honest about what those strengths and weaknesses are in trying to find VCs in addition to the capital they provide, but that can add some sort of value where your team is a little weaker. Um, that's the ideal scenario. Of course. And you alluded to this a few times, Jonathan, but you are a founder turned VC. Uh, there are a lot of founders, um, you know, watching right now that maybe, you know, once they are able to grow their companies and sell or get acquired, they could um, probably take a similar route. So I'd love to talk about uh, some of your early days, you know, with Space VC and also the pivot from founder to VC. Uh, what are some of the key lessons that you learned and uh, some of the advice that you'd want to share with our audience? Oh, 100%. How much There's time do we have? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Here's what I would say in all honesty. Um, I love building things. And so, you know, my favorite part of being a VC is working with the portfolio companies once we have them, right? Is jumping on calls, is jumping on board meetings, is getting into the weeds and, and really figuring out whatever the biggest challenges are, how we can kind of get through that. So for me, that journey from founder to VC early on, admittedly, 
uh, was a little difficult because there's a lot of admin and back office work that's required to stand up a VC firm that doesn't necessarily drive my passion for working with founders, right? Um, one of the things that I was also surprised by, maybe this is just my personal experience, but I thought as a founder with a successful exiting company, you know, to a certain extent, that jumping into VC would be super easy. Um, and, and I'll admit it was a little bit more difficult than I thought. Obviously, I made a lot of investors money on my first company and they were quick to write a check. But, you know, I, I was poor as a startup guy for 10 years. So I didn't have money to angel invest or anything like that. So what I would say is if you're thinking about jumping into VC, just like when you're a startup founder, you're going to get a lot of no's. Just work through that, right? Find the people that believe in you and your vision and your ability to execute. Um, and if you're really interested in being a VC, you know, maybe an in-between step that you could do is to syndicate deals through an SPV or write really small angel checks for a period of time. You know, I was lucky to write a couple of angel checks into some great companies like Stripe and SpaceX and BlockFi, but those were once they had already raised, you know, Series Bs, right? They weren't early days and it was when I, I got a little bit of capital. So um, yeah, if you're able to write angel checks, great, but don't let that dissuade you from just going forward and launching a fund. Uh, running a VC fund is like running your own startup. You have to think about your customers, your go-to-market, mm -hmm. what your unique competitive advantages, et cetera. Um, and so I love building a VC fund. Um, it's very similar to building a company, but just in different ways. Uh, which one has been more fun? Is that a mean question? Are you able to pick one or? Uh, it's not mean, it's just different. So sure. I'll be totally honest. Being a VC, I, I find to be more intellectually invigorating. You talk to founders solving dozens of different problems across a very large surface area. So you know, I jump from meeting to meeting and one company is building the next version of a private GPS constellation. The next call I have, someone is trying to mine this, the lunar surface for the ice caps to create helium three, like rocket fuel. Like you're learning constantly as a VC. If a VC tells you they know everything, they're lying. Like our jobs professionally is to learn and jump across those surface areas. So that part of it is really exciting and maybe tapped into something that as a founder, I didn't. But at the end of the day, the founders are the ones building. We're just here supporting you and, and providing capital and advice and making connections when we can. I can't do the work for founders. And so there's a part of me that always loves building. And so certainly there's that uh, adrenaline you get from being on the builder and founder side as well. Totally. We have a wonderful question from Carter Russ in our audience. And also guys, please bring in more questions. This guy invested in SpaceX for crying out loud. Um, so how do you guys value deep space companies knowing the long-term risk associated with each investment, uh, long horizon to fully realize value proposition? Yeah, it's not too dissimilar from how you might um, value other companies that are, are, are pre-revenue. You know, I think for a lot of VCs, you know, we're investing in a lot of software. So 10x, you know, revenue or, or ARR is kind of like the standard for a lot of software investments. Mm -hmm. In deep tech, to be honest, what we're seeing is most pre-seed deals are getting done, you know, under 10 million or 15 million valuation. Some seed deals, depending on how much they are, are raising, will get done anywhere from, you know, 15 to 25, I'll call it maybe 10 more recently. Uh, but really what we look for when we're making a decision, either on valuation or investment, especially in space as a thesis driven fund, is we really want to understand the end market that you're selling to. So what a lot of the time VCs will do when they're valuing a startup is try to understand and evaluate the TAM, the total addressable market that you're selling into. That's even more important in, in a deep tech industry like space where there might be a lot of CapEx required up front. So when we think about our valuation models, it's both a combination, Landon, of how much capital do you have to raise early on to get to cash flow or a revenue generating event? And how big is that addressable market um, that you're going after? And obviously, what milestones are you currently at and the team? And it's a little bit of a confidence factor, too, in terms of, of how big you can build. But uh, we're generally in that you know, valuation range that I shared uh, for, for deep tech early stage space companies. Totally. We just had a question come in that, um, you know, what do you look for in a pitch? You've kind of broke down a few of the things there. Um, we can kind of flip the question though. What don't you look for in a pitch? Well, let's see. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just answer the question around what I do look for in a pitch, because I think it's actually not too dissimilar from what other VCs look for. Mm -hmm. You know, early on when you're pre-seed, it is all about the team. It's all about the vision and it's all about your ability to articulate that and to understand the end problem that you're really pursuing. So for me, the most important thing when I have my first meeting with an entrepreneur is to learn about the person, understand as a former founder that went through the startup journey, do they have what it takes? Do, do I assess they have what it takes to kind of make it through the most difficult and through you know, the best times of, of the startup journey? What's their level of understanding of the market and the problem they're trying to solve? And do they have the right approach? And 
to be honest, understanding those three things are by far the most important before we do technical diligence, before we understand if they have customers, what the revenue composition is, all of those other things are secondary in my mind to that. So, you know, maybe that answers a little bit about what we don't look for early on. Um, but certainly, you know, for early stage deep tech companies, the biggest difference between them and early stage software companies is their growth trajectories are just a little bit more flat and slow early on before they scale, right? It takes more time to develop those technologies. So, you know, we're not necessarily looking as much at recurring revenue and, and you know, what your net retention rate is and what your, you know, upsell expansion motion is or product usage early on. What we're really trying to understand is, do you have your supplier contracts aligned? The things you're trying to do in space, is there space heritage? Has someone done this before? How de-risked is this technology? Have you assembled the right team to do it? Uh, in space, there's a lot of LOIs, letters of intent. We want to understand, are those binding, right? These customers, they say, when you deliver the product, how much tens or hundreds of millions of revenue is there potentially to close immediately? So it's just a slightly different motion to market. And those are the things that we look for. Awesome. Uh, we have another fun question from Megan in the audience. And we can take in two more questions. Uh, Go, we're... Megan. Two questions. Oh, I love yeah. it. <laughs> um, top five to 10. That's a big number. But top five to 10 traits you look for in founders that you think can go the distance and maybe pull from your personal experiences as a founder and, of course, the founders you work with today. Yeah, I, I would say one of the biggest things I've learned from being a founder and now being on the VC side is that you can have successful founders be from all different types of backgrounds. So there's not a one size cookie cutter, like these are the traits you need to have. So I would say whatever your strengths are, the most important strength and in, in like trait is to be self-aware, self-aware of what your strengths are and to build a founding team around that. However, common traits amongst founders that are successful, you know, certainly they have deep passion for the problem they're solving. Startups are too damn hard to pursue it unless you really have a deep passion for it. So if you're getting into it for financial reasons or, or external validation reasons, it's usually not a good reason. So I want to see the passion. Um, you know, usually there's a lot of determination and persistence as a part of it. The startup journey is difficult. So do they have traits that lead you to believe that they would persist when times get tough? Uh, a lot of founders are great collaborators and communicators. They need to be able to um, communicate to investors, to customers, to a team, what the vision is, what the challenges are they're trying to solve in good and bad times. And similarly, collaborate with other different, uh, you know, strength people with other different types of strengths and weaknesses. So those are some of the most important traits I would say we look for in, uh, in founders. Final question for you, Jonathan. I mentioned uh, at the top of your presentation that we were both in Miami this past week, and you just said that SpaceX might not just be the most important company in space, but most important company ever. Uh, we got to both see Elon speak at the All In Summit. Uh, what are your first initial thoughts? Yeah, Elon's great. Um, I still don't understand quite how he spends his time across all the companies he's working <laughs> on. I think that anytime I, I you know, in, in around him or hear him talk, I think that's always, you know, the thing that blows my mind the most. Mm -hmm. I think as it relates to SpaceX, you know, he, he talked about it a little bit at the All In Summit. SpaceX will continue to find really interesting business models that create a lot of profit that then they are able to use to build sustainable spacefaring, um, space flight and civilization to Earth and beyond. And I think that's a really interesting mission for a company that I've never really been a part of outside of SpaceX to have such a lofty mission like that, you know? And so regardless of what your personal views are about whether humans or infrastructure should go to Mars, will that happen in our lifetime, et cetera? I'm kind of of the belief of it's going to happen. There are enough smart people that, you know, and the technology is there, by the way, the technology is there to do this within the next decade, that it's going to happen. And I think for us, it's really a question of how can that make life on earth better? You know, what optionality does that give us? What can we understand about our climate better to make, you know, life more sustainable here? So uh, yeah, it's a really interesting journey that they're on. And, uh, you know, candidly, I think, you know, the next 10 years for SpaceX are, dare I say it, even more exciting than the last 10, which is hard to fathom. So Totally. And our producer, John, um, just mentioned something hilarious on the Zoom chat because he's actually using Starlink to produce this event. Hell um, yeah, let's go. <laughs> we thank Space VC and SpaceX for allowing us to produce this uh, event virtually. So thank you for recognizing the importance of Starlink and, uh, of course, making your awesome investment in uh, SpaceX. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. And I would just say anyone that's doing anything, um, you know, even adjacent to space, whether you're, you're in climate, whether you're in deep tech, broadly speaking, um, you know, feel free to reach out. We want to be as helpful as we can. So thanks for having us, Landon. Jonathan, thank you as always, man. Really appreciate you. 
we have Dell for Startups. So they are here for you. They are one of our amazing sponsors at Meet Our Fund today. Dell Technologies is passionate about supporting startups and making sure they have all the knowledge, resources, and of course, technology they need to make their dreams possible. Um, please feel free to check out uh, the latest tech from Dell for Entrepreneurs and reach out for exclusive discounts for entrepreneurs. Um, give them lots of love on socials and the chat. Um, I would like to invite YJ Lin from Dell for Startups. Hi, YJ. Hi, Stephanie. Really excited to be here with y'all today. I'll introduce a little bit about myself. I'm a senior program manager here at Dell Technologies. Um, what that means is that I work with startup communities all across the U.S. to figure out how we can support startups and entrepreneurs. And Dell being a very big company, we have a lot of resources, we have a lot of initiatives, and today I'm here to present them all to you. So kind of starting off, why are we doing this? It kind of goes back to Michael Dell's stories um, back in 1984 when he realized that no other computer company at his time was creating customized solutions for people. So with only $1,000 in startup capital in his um, dorm room at UT Austin, he decided through cutting costs, reducing delivery times, and figuring out how to provide excellent customer service, how he was able to uh, sell $80,000 worth of systems back then after his first year. And then four years later, of course, he dropped out of college and um, went public. And so where Dell Technologies now is we have a lot of these different partnerships, whether that's with Microsoft or Intel or any other Dell companies under its umbrella to support you in every single aspect of your IT infrastructure. So what that looks like for y'all is that you have dedicated program managers with entrepreneurial experience. Um, my manager himself has a, a coffee distribution business back in Argentina. I started some of my businesses in e-commerce and developing patents for my university. We have a lot of uh, talented people with entrepreneurial experience that is here to help you and kind of understand how Dell scaled to where it is, but more importantly, try to figure out how we can service all your technology needs. What that looks like is we have over 600 startup IT advisors across Nashville and Round Rock that's more than happy to be on the phone with you to answer any questions that you have, anything from you know, what software do I need? What type of hardware should I be looking for? What type of processing power or video card do I need if it's needed at all? And they're here for you to answer any questions that you have. So instead of hiring your own IT person, um, these are questions that we're more than happy to answer for you so that you can do your own research. Or like Stephanie said earlier, if there's something that you guys do need, we're more than happy to help you guys save some money. What that means from us, knowing that you guys are a startup entrepreneur, that we also have technology planning consultation. So what that looks like is that we have an OEM team and this is not a big or not as well known as, as they should know, um, should be, but what they essentially do is they work with any startups or large corporations that are looking to develop a hardware solution. In fact, a lot of MRI machines at hospitals actually have, um, you know, Dell chips inside of them. So if you're developing a hardware solution and need help from an OEM manufacturing side, we're more than happy to get you in touch with some of our engineers to figure out how we can help you with that as well. If you guys do need anything, of course, helping you guys with financing rewards. And then we also have an offer to give you free remote data migration so that if you're uh, refreshing your office with uh, newer equipment, hopefully that will be a more seamless uh, transition. What that also looks like from a membership perspective is that we're constantly on the road. So offering free co-working space in San Francisco, I might just take you up on that, Elaine. But um, what this looks like is that, you know, we're constantly sponsoring. We'd love to invite you out. So if you join our platform, anytime we have additional tickets or anytime we're going to be at a um, you know, local city near you where we're hosting an event, we'd love to invite you. We're also launching a pitch competition. We're spending half a million in prizes and products uh, this year with 12 different startup communities all across the U.S. This will be a culmination of 16 pitch competitions total. But if you're interested in learning more about what that pitch competition is or when we'll be in your city, definitely reach out to us and we're more than happy to get you added on our distribution list. Next, what that journey looks like. Well, honestly, just get in touch with us. We'd love to learn more about what your business needs are. Tell us about what you do, what made you passionate about developing this product. And I'm more than happy to get in touch with 
anyone at Dell that can support you, whether that's our corporate innovation group, whether that's our Dell Tech Ventures team, or whether that's one of our advisors that can help you with technology needs. We're happy to get in touch with our team to figure out what type of resources are available here for you. Because at the end of the day, skipping ahead a little bit, on step five is we love to get you in touch with our media companies that we work with to share the story of how we're both driving human progress. The way we do that is by having that relationship with one of our startup advisors. And like I mentioned, it's free. Um, Delta Capital, they're really, they're also our venture arm within Dell Technologies. They spend over $250 million a year, but their main focus is in enterprise technology solutions. So if you're a startup in any of these categories, DevOps, data management, AIML, cybersecurity, cloud infrastructure, feel free to reach out and we're more than happy to get you in touch with them. Um, for them, pre predominantly, they're focused on early stage or series A uh, funding companies. So if you feel that you're a startup that fits these criteria, we're more uh, happy to get you in touch with that team. We also have a group called the Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network founded by a bunch of talented female leaders within Dell. And this is a community platform supporting female founders. So if you're an ally or a female founder yourself, feel free to join the platform. And I'll do a quick demonstration of what that platform looks like, but they host a lot of events uh, with a lot of thought leaders or influencers to kind of help talk about what we could do better to share resources together. Um, last and not least, uh, this is my team. We're really, really small team. I'm a little bit sick, but I'm still the last person that can present this for us today. So I'm more than happy to get in touch with you um, and figure out how we can better support startup communities all across the US. And that's pretty much it for my presentation. And I'll go into questions and share my screen on um, other stuff that we may have. Thanks, Stephanie. And Lennon. Excellent. Thank you, YJ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just had a question on um, inside.com about how to reach out to you. So I'm definitely going to um, reshare that info. So when um, founders who are attending today reach out to you, what what's the right fit? What kind of founder should be um, reaching out to utilize all the resources that Dell has? Honestly, we're a large company, so we can support everyone. I know that's hard to say for certain people is like well if you support everyone <laughs> then let's do yeah. like we have you know our teams are segmented to support commercial medium-sized businesses and our team specifically supports startups and new relationships with dell i mean we understand that you know as a startup maybe you might not have funding now but it only takes six months a year you might get that million dollar check who are you going to reach out to so we're very focused on early stage but whatever size company you are we're more than happy to support you Excellent. This is the win for everyone here attending today. It doesn't matter what vertical you're in, what stage you're in. Um, and audience, if you have more questions, bring them to us. YJ is here uh, with all the info about Dell's um, startup ecosystem. I see one here that says, um, does, De does the Dell group engage closely to get their ventures group to invest? So maybe you can tell us about your investing arm. Um, very briefly about them since they are a separate team. Um, mm -hmm. but for the most part, uh, they typically reach out if they want, uh, to invest in you. Um, but for the, you know, we, we do talk about them. We do bring them up. They're very specific on enterprise technology solutions. So, okay, um, big. yeah, very, very big on that piece. Um, as you're probably aware why, but one of our biggest unicorns is, uh, DocuSign. So Dell was able mm. to invest in DocuSign. Uh, before they uh, also blew up. Um, getting in touch with them right now just simply means like, well, if there's something, if you feel like you fit that criteria, you're more than happy to send us the pitch deck, uh, startups.dell.com or my email directly, and I'm happy for it. Um, they're also a really, really small team and imagining how many customers or people that we talk to on a daily basis. Um, at the minimum, I can guarantee they can look at it for you. Okay, that's good to know. So larger enterprise companies. And then we heard about um, Dell for startups and Dell for entrepreneurs. Can you distinguish um, the two offerings there? Sure. So I don't know if this made big news, but we actually rebranded. So during March 11th, uh, during South by here in Austin, we were operating on Dell for entrepreneurs for the longest time, probably oh, for okay. a year and two years. 
and then we rebranded to call ourselves Delphor Startups. Um, okay. So this is just more uh, realigned with our missions and goals. And um, just from our sides, we now have more resources to support them. That is very cool. And that does make a lot of sense. Yeah, um, we definitely want your contact info again. I know um, Esther from Dell is in the Zoom chat. Maybe she can throw your email there. And um, we can also have our team uh, put it on inside.com. Yeah. Great resources for everyone here. YJ, thank you so much for being here and sharing all that with us. No, absolutely, Stephanie. And if anything, one last thing I can say is that um, how you can help me. Well, um, especially if you're a startup that needs any technology wise, that's what I'm here to do. So first, happy to provide any uh, support um, and see what that looks like. We are, are a really small team at Dell Technologies. I know Dell is a big company, but we can do a lot of different things. So um, love to hear from, from the people that we're supporting, how we can best serve them, especially mm. if you're running a startup community or know a startup community. We're trying to go local. So if there's any uh, you know, influencer or community builder out there that's trying to support their, uh, their peers in the startups community at their city, please let me know. I'm more than happy to figure out how we can work together to do that. Oh, that's smart. So anyone in the audience that might be in the business of creating networks, having in-person events, getting people together, especially in the startup space. Yeah. Happy to collaborate okay. with them. All right. Is this correct? yj.lin at dell.com. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I put it in Zoom. We'll throw it on inside.com as well. And everyone can um, follow up with you. Thank you again. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, team. 